So you've probably not lived in a cave for the last few years, which means at some point you've probably heard of the word populism. Whether it's in the context of Brexit, Trump, or even Le Pen in France, it's likely that this isn't the first time you've heard of it. So in today's video, we're going to explain what populism is and what it means for the future of politics. Before we get to that though, I just want to say a quick thank you. Thank you to our over 1,000 patrons. Thanks to your donations, we've hit our first two goals, which means that the TLDR News podcast and a new series of This Week in Parliament are coming soon. To help us reach our next goal, getting a TLDR News studio, and to get exclusive perks every month, head over to our Patreon page. There's a link in the description. So we've all heard of populism, but actually understanding what it is, how it relates to politics, and which countries it's actually risen in is a lot more difficult than it sounds. In this video, we'll try and explain that. Before we proceed though, it's important to note that what we say in this video isn't definitive. Populism is a hugely contested topic, and there isn't actually even a definition that's widely accepted. So please bear that in mind when watching this video. There are though two basic interpretations of what populism is. These are known as the discursive approach and the ideology approach. I promise this isn't going to get as complicated as you think it is. Before we take on these approaches, let's discuss what both camps generally agree on. They agree that populism is the belief that there's an antagonistic relationship between the people and the elite. Populists see people as being sovereign and as being the most important part of a democracy. They see the people as good and the elite as bad, and populist politicians will generally try and present themselves as a true representation of the people, who will try and take down the corrupt elite. Think about the US where Donald Trump talks about draining the swamp. Both scholars who believe in the discursive and the ideological view generally agree with this division. Where they differ is what these views actually mean to the person who's making the claims. Those who believe in a discursive approach, such as Ernesto Laclau and Bart Bonakowski, see it as more of a way to win power. They think of it as a communication style, of a way of speaking to people which will ultimately gain them political office. Almost as if it isn't fundamental to who the politicians are. The scholar Bonakowski has pointed out that US presidents have in the past used populist claims in the campaign, and then not exercised populist policy once they're in office. This adds to the weight of the discursive camp's claim. To an extent, we can even see this with some of the claims made by Theresa May in the last few months. To all intents and purposes, May isn't a populist. She's about as establishment as they get. She went to Oxford University, worked at the Bank of England, and was Home Secretary of the UK before becoming Prime Minister. Clearly, she doesn't believe that the elite are bad and frustrate democracy. She herself is the epitome of the elite. However, back in March, when she failed to get her withdrawal agreement through, she claimed that she was on your side, going on to say, You, the public, have had enough. You're tired of the infighting, you're tired of the political games and the arcane procedural rows, tired of MPs talking about nothing else but Brexit, when you have real concerns about our children's schools, our national health service, knife crime, Clearly there's an argument to be made here that Theresa May used populist rhetoric to try and win favour for her withdrawal agreement, using it as a communication style. Even some newspapers were calling her out for her populist rhetoric. Anyway, on the other side of the debate, those such as Cass Muda see it as more of an ideology, something fundamental to the politicians who are making the claim. Muda and others do concede though that it's not a full-blown ideology, like conservatism or liberalism. Populism doesn't have answers to some of the political questions in the same way that conservatism and liberalism do. Because of this, some think of it as something known as a thin ideology. This is the idea that populism is usually combined with another ideology, such as nationalism. While populism alone doesn't form an overarching ideology, it needs to be combined with something else. In Western Europe, this has tended to be nationalism. Right-wing populists throughout Western Europe tend to have a populist, nationalist ideology. Think of parties like the National Front in France, who wanted to reduce the level of immigration and ban religious face coverings. Think of the True Finns party, who used this in their party broadcast. There was once a small nation, inhabited by content and happy people. 
one day, the country's democratically chosen leaders decided to betray the promises they had made to their people. They robbed their own more and more, while at the same time opening their country's doors to the foreign nations of the world and thinking little of its impending risks to the safety of its own people, these leaders opened the floodgates, taking in anyone, even those who were never in need of a place of refuge. And think of UKIP, another Brexit party, whose leader Nigel Farage has wanted to reduce immigration and said that he felt uncomfortable with people speaking foreign languages on public transport. Although, left-wing populists do exist too, such as Podemos in Spain. But throughout Western Europe, it does appear to be a trend of populists combining their populist ideology with a nationalistic ideology. As stated earlier, populism sees a united people working against the elite. Nationalistic populists define this based on nationality. Unlike the discursive approach, populism and nationalism merge together to create an ideology for government. It's not just used as a way to win political favour. It's enough of an ideology to see commonalities between nationalist populist parties throughout Western Europe. That is, overall, what populism means. The next question to be asked is what does populism mean for democracy? If the belief is that people are sovereign, that's democratic, right? But despite this, populism is usually used in a negative context. Why is this? Well, the answer lies in what democracy is. Again, democracy isn't something that's agreed upon. There's no one way of defining what makes a state democratic. But we generally agree that there are two aspects of democracy, popular democracy and liberal democracy. Popular democracy is the belief that people are sovereign. As explained earlier, populism not only adheres to this, but puts this belief at its very core. Inherently then, populism is more compatible with popular democracy. However, liberal democracy is the belief in things such as freedom of speech, avoiding the tyranny of the majority, protecting the rule of law, and separation of powers. It's a belief that certain things such as these come above popular democracy. That even if the people at times want to undermine these, they're so fundamental that they should be inherent to democracy itself. Populism doesn't. It sees people as always being the most important. In places such as Turkey, populists such as Erdogan have clearly undermined some of the core liberal democratic principles. Erdogan claimed that his story is the story of the people and gave the people a referendum over whether they should abolish the prime minister and give the president much more power. Erdogan was himself the president at the time. This clearly undermined the core principle of separation of powers. Additionally, back in 2010, another constitutional referendum gave him more powers to appoint judges to the judiciary. The result has been a slow reduction in the level of democracy in Turkey. Although there's no way of measuring democracy, the Freedom House score is a good way of looking generally at the level of freedom and democracy in a country. The higher the score, the worse the quality of democracy. As you can see, as Erdogan and his populist party have been in charge, the quality of democracy in Turkey has gradually declined. Additionally, after a coup, thousands were put in jail, including political opponents. Populists tend to see a majority in parliament as a right to do anything. They see this as the will of the people, and if that means undermining liberal democracy, that's their right given to them by the population. This is something that Erdogan has clearly done in Turkey, and something that can happen whenever a populist gains power. This belief in popular democracy can be fundamentally threatening to liberal democracy, as the two normally don't work in conjunction. In Muda and Kaltwasser's book, Populism, A Very Short Introduction, they go as far as saying that populism is fundamentally opposed to democratic liberalism. Briefly, that was an overview of what populism is, and some of the challenges it poses. Obviously, some see it as a positive force, a method of challenging the move away from representative democracy and towards a more technocratic one, where experts make decisions. Some see it as challenging self-interest politicians and giving more power to the people, so they claim it's unsurprising that the academic elite generally see it as a threat. As you know, here at TLDR we try not to pick a side. Some view populism as a force for good, some see it as a force for bad. But what do you think? Let us know your opinions in the comments. Donald Trump is a figure regularly accused of being populist. 
If you're interested in hearing more about him and about American news more generally, consider subscribing to our channel, TLDR News US. We'll be posting there very soon, so be sure to subscribe to stay updated. If you did enjoy this video, we've got a quick recommendation for you, and that's the series Years and Years on the BBC. It follows Emma Thompson as an aspiring populist leader and really highlights how populists succeed and potentially what happens when they gain power. Episodes are available on the BBC iPlayer now. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified once we post other videos. You can also find us across other social networks simply by searching for TLDR News. Um...